Next to a very busy major road in Jerusalem is Gazelle Valley, the biggest urban natural site in Israel. Here roam the endangered mountain gazelle, migratory birds, and reptiles among the hustle and bustle of the oldest city in the world. I am Marcia Civic, and today we will be learning about Gazelle Valley, along with its challenges, its wildlife, and success of being a place that all people of any age, culture, and religion can enjoy. What is most fascinating about this park is that it's not only in such a busy, culturally rich city, it is free to all who visit, with big emphasis on free and all. It's accessible to the public, it's got paths, some of the paths are wheelchair accessible. Which means, if you take what I said before, free entrance to the Gazelle Valley, 364 days a year, and all the other things. This means that a grandmother in a wheelchair, who comes from a social, economic, relatively low background, mm -hmm. can still get on a bus to a relatively central area in Jerusalem, get off the bus with her wheelchair and roll herself into, I don't know, I don't know why I chose a grandmother, but anyway, <laughs> you know, anyone, anyone, yeah. basically anyone, yeah. enjoy, really one of my favorite, I've taken thousands of pictures in the Gazelle Valley over the years, yeah. thousands. This is Ika Chipman, and I'm speaking to him over the internet. He's in Jerusalem, and I am in California. Ika is the marketing person for the Gazelle Valley, and we'll be sharing this urban because wildlife success story today. Is of a 94, I think, year old woman in her wheelchair with her 50 year old grandchildren standing around her. Grandchildren took her for a walk through the Gazelle Valley. That's wonderful. Um, so what we're actually getting here is an opportunity for the public to see nature in a way that is very accessible. Gazelle Valley, like most urban natural areas, had a rough and tumble start. It is prime land where developers would love to see buildings for businesses or housing. It wasn't until an unlikely group of neighbors started to work together and defend the land that the natural value of Gazelle Valley was actually discovered. This area, it's a, it's a small valley that until the early 90s was physically connected with the hills outside of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So naturally, any land-based animal could move from the valley to anywhere else out in the wild. A population could, could, could combine they could run away if they wanted to run away from a jackal. They could mate with um, a male or a female from a different part of the Jerusalem hills. And there was what normally happens in nature, a certain element of moving around. Also animals that don't migrate have a tendency to move a little bit from one area to another in the course of time. Yeah. And that basically ended as the southern uh, Jerusalem got, got used for a football stadium a soccer stadium, I should say, in America, a new mall, a pretty big new road, and all of this to have blocked off what is now called the Gazelle Valley from what was then just a valley that kind of slid into the end of the edge of Jerusalem. In the 1990s, population grew exponentially in Israel and Jerusalem, causing the need for less vacant land and more housing also causing an undetermined future for Gazelle Valley. In the previous 30, 40 years, the place was, how do you say, rented out really long term. When you rent something out for 30 years, the place was rented rented out to a few kibbutzim, a few small, small villages that uh, used the valley for very simple agriculture, they grew uh, peaches and plums, and okay. which became not very financially viable in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, as worldwide transportation became much more common and much, much cheaper. So there was no point in continuing to raise such a small agricultural project. So they wanted to build on the area. Again, at the time, nobody would really check. Nobody really looked even what was being asked for, what the permit was that was being... Permits were given 
They could build yeah. basically anything they were on the start. In the late 90s, they actually started work and they actually, there was a tractor that started work and straightened out the ground. And people from the neighborhood ran and physically stopped the tractor. Now, again, I'm gonna stop a second. We're used to thinking, I'll be not very politically correct. That's the way we are Israelis and that's the way I am personally. I, I don't believe so much in political and PC. Um, <laughs> however, at the time it was even more clear that the, there are certain social economic levels of people that are into environment preservation and wildlife and let's take care of the whales because we're not hungry. And let's take care of the crocodiles and the poor old elephants because we have the free uh, uh, mind set and we have the ability to spend time and money on these things we believe that are important. Mm -hmm. You need to belong to a certain, I think worldwide you see it. I, I know definitely yeah. where I come from you see it. You belong to, if you care about environment, you'll usually belong to a certain social environment. Mm -hmm. social economic group the neighborhoods around the gazelle valley are not do not belong to those groups one of the neighborhoods is known for being a very problematic neighborhood violence drugs poverty today it's less extreme than it was and in the 90s it was already less extreme than it was in the 70s but still we're not talking about a rich neighborhood we're talking about a, a neighborhood where if you, if i'm going to be stereotypical you would not expect an, an, an environmental struggle to start from that neighborhood. But those were the people that came down and physically stopped the first tractor. Physically stopped the first tractor, very gently explained to the tractor driver that he shouldn't be doing this because the gazelles live here, and gently sent him home. I'm not sure how gentle it was. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's how it all started. And then very quickly, the SPNI, the Society of Protection of Nature in Israel, and other green organizations got involved in this struggle. And again, there's a connection here to the community that at the time was very un unexpected and un unpredictable. No one would no, no one would have expected something like that to happen. But the connection happened anyway. And then what happened was a struggle that was legal and public at the same time. A legal struggle because the kibbutzim that were allowed to use the land for agriculture actually were supposed to end the use of the land in the mid-80s, but nobody was following. In other words, government offices and municipalities were not doing their job. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, the public struggle. The public struggle means that this basically unused piece of land it was unused because as i said the kibbutzim stopped spending money on, on the agriculture mm -hmm. on the one hand on the other hand it's in the middle of the city so people walk past people use it as a shortcut everybody knows there are a few gazelles there some people continue to call the valley by the name emic prihar the prihar valley which was the name of the company that oh, okay. grew that, that did the agriculture there and other people started to call it the Gazelle Valley. And the name was very important. Because if you're going to try to struggle and you're going to try to protect a piece of 50 acres with prickles, a few olive trees, mm -hmm. and some mud, chances are you're going to fail. But if it's the Gazelle Valley, then, you know, it's about branding. During this time, what happened to the gazelle? Were they still thriving and living on this land? So at the time, approximately 30 gazelles lived there. I gotta say approximately because in the course of the years, what happens is a natural raise and drop in the numbers. Okay, around springtime is when the females give birth, usually to one baby a year. Okay. And in the course, all year round, you've got someone dying, someone gets old, someone gets run over. This all the time happens. So the numbers were going up and down between 25 and 35 from the early 90s till the early 2000s. Okay. In that time, professors and doctors in famous universities wrote articles about how a cutoff 
population of gazelles in the middle of the city, 30 gazelles are not going to survive. And the main conclusion from these articles was that gazelles don't know how to read because they survived. Right. Um, so even though they're interbreeding, probably, right? Because there's They no... were interbreeding. That's okay. all they could do at the time. Okay. They survived anyway for about a decade. Around, around, to make a very long story very short, in the year 2010, court ruled that he would seem to not have any more rights on the land and that it should be a public public land. In Israel, a lot of the land is public. Even if houses are, private houses are built on public land, in some cases, you're basically renting very long term. You're renting, you're, you're renting the land from the state, from the, from, from the state for 50 years, for 100 years, for 99 years, and you build a house. Mm -hmm. A lot of the land in Israel is public. And so the, the Gazelle Valley went back to the hands of the public. And then what started was even more interesting because it was a, a ping pong between the SP and the Center of Protection of Nature in Israel and the, the people that started the struggle and the public that lives around the valley who different people have different interests, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was an interesting ping pong that basically started with saying, what do you, the public, want to have on this land? Do you want a shopping center? Do you want a park? Do you want... Well, there were a few possibilities thrown out. Mm -hmm. And the option that was happily taken by the public with gigantic majority was that the place should stay as a green lung. Mm -hmm. Not yet. The phrase urban wildlife site was used by some people, not used by others. It was that, that's what the public basically said that they want. That's the, right. the, the neighbors of the, of the park. So the public decided to have a green area. And so who, who's involved with the planning and how was the park developed? The public was involved in planning in the, not in the very nitty gritty details, mm -hmm. but in the very general outline. And then the, the part the, the the 50 acres got divided into three unequal parts. One part is the, the natural core into which hu visitors are not supposed to enter at all, mm -hmm. and human beings are not supposed to enter. That's on the one hand. The second part is a very intensive area, parking lot, the, the entrance building, bathrooms, stuff like that okay. and in the middle between the very intensive area and the natural core you've got an area that is natural on the one hand it's, it looks like any any it, it looks like any any other location in the jerusalem hills so now you have this green space and the middle of the city what what challenges do you face or what challenges do the gazelle and humans face. Somebody that worked for the kibbutzim used to come and release hounds, hunting dogs, oh. in the gazelle valley. And they will almost never be able to catch up with the gazelle. They run pretty much at the same speed. But if the dog chases the gazelle to the road, the gazelle is going to get run over. And pretty quickly, the population weaned from about 30 gazelles in 2005, six, seven, to three females in 2012. Wow. So was the, purpose to, was the purpose of these dogs, were people hunting, trying to His hunt purpose, yeah. His oh, okay. purpose was to get rid of the gazelles. Oh, okay. And then you got rid of the branding. There are no gazelles in the Gazelle Valley. If there are no gazelles in the Gazelle Valley, then why can't we build it? Let's build. Yeah. Because as long as court didn't rule that, that the, that the valley goes back to the public, then there was still a chance to say, listen, there's no gazelles there, they're all lying. Yeah. Um, wow. So you, you ended up with three females, basically. Three females. So, so how did the population start to grow again? 
and get you... back to 60, 70 that we have now. Yeah, so did you have to bring... I'll give you three guesses, and if you know basic biology, I think you'll figure it out. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, look, the first thing we needed to do was to fence off the, the valley. Okay. So the gazelles could, could continue to run away. There were no dogs released. There was no entrance to the valley for about three years. Okay. So the fence was the first move. And the second move was in the course of, I'd say, from 2012 to 2017, 18, we brought in gazelles, not only males, m more males and females. Mm -hmm. In 2012, we brought a young male who looked around, saw three females, didn't understand what he's supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> Later on, you know, you let nature do its course. Yeah. You figure it out. In the course of the years, every now and then you get a gazelle that got run over. You get a gazelle that isn't managing in the zoo. You get all kinds of stories like that. Not from the, from zoos, actually, we don't have gazelles. But you get all kinds of different stories of gazelles that show, that get given to the valley by the authorities, by the authority, by the, what would be the right translation? The, by rehabilitators the, or the the authority that the the government authority the government office that's responsible for nature preservation mm -hmm. basically the national parks and uh, one of their responsibilities is also enforce law enforcement in the field of wildlife and one of the elements is that it is illegal in Israel to raise a wild animal at home mm -hmm. or, or in your private garden. It's the same thing. Yeah. You, you're not allowed to raise a tiger, a gazelle, or a turtle or a lizard in a box. Oh, wow. In Israel, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a very limited list of, of, you know, animals that belong in nature in Israel. It is illegal to raise at home. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a scorpion or about a, a bear. We don't have bears, but yeah. <laughs> going for the biggest thing I can think of. Yeah. So now, like any law, also this law gets um, ignored sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it is the National Parks Authority. It's their responsibility to enforce the law. Every now and then, you run into a family that is raising a gazelle in their backyard. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen so much. Uh, I don't want to sound racist, so I won't say who, but it, it happens in, you see it in certain populations more than others. The female that I mentioned before that attacked somebody. Oh yeah, I wanted to hear that story. She yeah. thought that she's a dog basically. Yeah. yeah. She got raised in, the, in, in some family's backyard she got confiscated from the backyard and brought to the gazelle valley and she always thought she's a dog she when it was cold she would come to the entrance building and bump it with her nose and ask to be let in <laughs> i've got a hilarious picture you see her face we call her johanna <laughs> you see her face and you see kind of there's kind of a glass window so you see how she blew against the window because she wanted to get in? Yeah. And how she created kind of a haze <laughs> on the window. From her brain, um, yeah. She, yeah. She used to look for human attention. And how do, how do you look for human attention? You come and rub your head against a human being. Right. That's what she learned. She would do that where she was raised. So she would get attention. She had a reference for... Uh, men of a certain age and up mm -hmm. i don't know what the smell i don't know what it is something reminded her of home that's who she preferred and when and when people wouldn't it's not only it's there was a general tendency she, there was a guy that worked he was 20 something he was in his early 20s yeah. and she would not leave him alone now she would try to climb him with her hooves oh <laughs> that could that it's, could hurt yeah. it didn't <laughs> yeah, that could be pretty painful. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so she would try to look for attention. Once she was in heat, and when she was pregnant, then again nature did its course. She stayed away from human beings, and as soon as she was pregnant anymore, she went back to her more humanish kind of behaviors. Interesting. It was very funny to watch her in the course of the years. She donated. She donated. She contributed, if I'm not mistaken, four.
cells, three females and one male, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Wow. To the pack, to the to the herd. We are right now already releasing gazelles to nature. Oh, okay. Where uh, where do you release them? Probably the happiest. Yeah. We release them in at the moment in, in how should I explain this to people who don't know the map of Israel? There's an area where there is a strong gazelle population. Okay. And it's a gigantic area and it's fenced off just south of Haifa. Oh. So that's one good place to release them. And hopefully in the very, very near future, I will be allowed to discuss how they're being released in another two areas. But at the moment, due to in organizational politics, mm -hmm. I am expected to not uh, discuss these new two areas. The story of Gazelle Valley seems to be a successful urban wildlife story. That um, makes sense. It's important to say, it's important to tell as a part of the story, the Jerusalem municipality understood the potential of the Gazelle Valley. And the municipality is who in the end said, okay, if there's going to be a Gazelle Valley here, then we're going to spend this and this much money on the development, on the initial development. And about 10% of that every year on the maintenance. We're talking about less than 2 million shekels a year. But that's, that, that's, it shows municipalities that Main, maintaining a, an urban wildlife site is not a very expensive story mm -hmm. because you lay nature on its course. Now look, we didn't plant so many trees. We brought in injured gazelles from other places in Israel and we enabled things to start happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there's an, uh, and one more important thing. The physical development includes development for humans to be able to enjoy a place. And it includes development of the natural habitat, but development in such a way that it stays the same as what would be normal for the Jerusalem hills. Mm -hmm. so for example, there's an artificial pool about 10 acres big, 30 dunam. I That's got the big. numbers a bit wrong. 30 dunam is about eight acres. Yeah. Seven, eight acres. An artificial pond with a few smaller pools leading down towards it. And that's an attraction for, for migrating birds. And then all of a sudden you've got different endangered species of birds that migrate and spend the winter in Jerusalem, or that migrate and stop in Jerusalem, and we didn't used to see them in the past. That's or amazing. we saw them in the past, and we saw them less and less and less. And now that there's suddenly this attraction with the water, then they actually stop. You see growing numbers of them. So it's nice to talk about the gazelles and how, you know, we're saving. Hopefully this is a part of saving them. Yeah. But it's not only gazelles. Right. It's um, a species of duck that I keep forgetting the English name. I can Google it later. So Lel Bitzot is in Hebrew, just for the recording. Yeah. I'll send you the name. Okay. The English name when we're done. I saw the um, picture on, on the website, actually. Or what the brownish you kind of duck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with its wings out this way. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. know the name either. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to, yeah, yeah. yeah, I wanted to talk about the different species that you do have in the Gazelle Valley because I know there's birds and you're working with turtles as well, right? Or yes, like so. But I'll let you continue. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the turtles go back to the story of keeping your ears open. Yeah. And listening to the team just like you listen to the public. So there was somebody on the on the team this is what everybody three years ago, mm -hmm. four years ago, he was doing national service. Instead of going into the army or instead of going into the army, he did national service. And he was volunteering at the valley on a daily basis. And suddenly he connected between his understanding that Turtles are an endangered species, on the one hand. Actually, one should say tortoises, but Americans think that's a strange, a strange word. 
Yeah. These are I land didn't... animals. Turtles are the ones that swim. That swim, yeah. Um, I always get caught on that too, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, he called it there an endangered species. Uh-huh. And that as kids, I mean, I as a kid, if I would go to the valley behind the neighborhood where I grew up, there was no such thing as not seeing a tortoise. Mm. There was no such thing. And now it's pretty rare to see them if you're on a walk outside. Oh. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, they're not such a difficult species to to take care of and to save. Sea turtles have a very high success rate in, in preservation projects. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, he also realized that there is not a single kindergarten that, do, that doesn't own its own private tortoise that lives in a box yeah and eats cabbage and cucumbers <laughs> so put one and one together i don't know i don't know how nobody did this before but he put one and one together and he said wait a minute these tortoises are living in boxes that's illegal yeah. they're eating cucumbers which are not so good for them it's like raising a child on nothing but chocolate oh and I the tortoises that, love yeah. it yeah but it's not so good for them they need to eat all kinds of different leaves yeah. Um, and leaves, not fruit. Technically oh. speaking, a cucumber is a fruit. You don't right. put it in the food salad, but it's still a fruit. Um, <laughs> yeah, like tomatoes. Yeah. 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 The difference between knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> yeah. Knowledge is you know that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not to put it in the fruit. <laughs> uh, so he put two to two. Omer is his name. Realize, yeah. realize he put one and one together and he realized, wait a minute. Let's tell them that it's illegal. Let's tell them that it's an endangered species. And let's suggest that they bring their tortoises to the Gazelle Valley, where we will see how we take care of them. Mm-hmm. The sad story is, no, the happy story is, we thought we'd get 20, 30 tortoises. Within less than a month, we found ourselves with, I don't remember, 300, 350 tortoises. Oh my gosh, yeah. Y- yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we planned with them. We we built an imperial shop that was what ten meters long, thirty feet long by by fifteen feet wide. Yeah. And we were planning to keep them there and we had a vet that was going to come and take a look at them and decide which ones of them will not be able to survive in nature and we need to continue to keep take care of. And which ones of them can survive in nature and which need some in between kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, within less than a day, the enclosure was exploding. Yeah. We used the enclosure that we that were that we weren't using at the time for gazelles because when you get a gazelle that got injured in a car accident and it gets brought to the gazelle valley, then you put it in an enclosure and you let it get used to the new area and get used to the sound and see through a fence what the place looks like. Mm-hmm. And only then you release it to the to the whole valley. The enclosure was free at the time. We filled it with tortoises. We found ourselves spending hours, 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 those few weeks. We currently have a pretty large number. I'm not sure exactly how many. I don't want to just throw out numbers, but we have dozens of tortoises in the, in the valley. We have about 15 in the original enclosure. In order for people to learn the story, in order for people to learn that a wild animal isn't, it's illegal to raise at home. You cannot feed a wild animal with human food. Right. And if you do so, then you're preventing it from from going back to nature. Some of them get all kinds of distortions in their, uh, what's it called? What they have on their back. Oh, the shell? The shell? The shell, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. it gets soft, it doesn't... It, it gets distorted, and then it gets... You, wouldn't, you and I wouldn't call it soft. You and I would call it still hard, but it's 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 not so strong anymore. Okay, brilliant. So, so some of them won't survive the simplest attack by a bird of prey. If they fall or anything like that, they're dead. Mm-hmm. So they can't be released. Some of them can be released. Some of them spent only a year in some kindergarten and got released in the Gazelle Valley. Some of them spent time in in somebody's garden rather than eating cucumbers in a box each one has its own story Mm -hmm. it's interesting to see how people suddenly realize what's going on and then they come to learn about wildlife they come to release their 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 tortoise it's it's a very educational process for a family 
or for a teacher to say, wait a minute. Yeah. I wasn't supposed to be doing this. That's great. That's key. And then go explain yeah. to the kids. Yeah. Then go to explain to the kids what you're doing. Do you have a lot of school groups for, come in, like uh, for education purposes, like school tours before the pandemic, probably? But I I want to say two things. Yes, okay. and I don't. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, because yes, we do. Yeah. No, yes, because yes, we do. Seriously. Yeah. I want to say I don't know because, again, you don't need to coordinate. You don't need to pay. Oh, so and you don't have so like big. coordinated events where yeah, you bring in we have yeah. uh we have a system to estimate how many people came and we watch what, who's coming in and there's only one very active entrance so so we do know okay i'm lying if i say we don't know but the point is you know you get all kinds of surprises mm -hmm. you get look jerusalem has a jewish ultra orthodox population which normally is not very busy with environmental issues it's a cultural thing, mm -hmm. and it's a financial thing. They're not busy with it. And suddenly you see them showing up at the Gazelle Valley, and suddenly you see them fascinated by the similarity between, like a family asked me one day, how do you know, how will you know when you have too many gazelles here, and it will be time to release them? Yeah. So I made the parallel between how they will behave when there'll be too many of them, and how his kids behave when there's too many of them in a small space and they can't run away anywhere. Yeah. It's it's mind boggling for them to see the similarities between us as mammals and the gazelles as mammals. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you say, wait a minute, there's a whole world here that doesn't contradict our ultra orthodox way of life. We were just not aware of it. So suddenly you get more and more of the ultra orthodox going up in the park. That's great. Uh, That's... I'm, embarrassed, I'm embarrassed to say when we started out, we had only Hebrew on the website. Mm -hmm. I'm still embarrassed to say we only have one page in Arabic on the website. The reason for this is basically the history of who fought for the Gazelle Valley and who the, the personal, you know, people write in the tongue. Things are happening on, on both. On the one hand, you see more and more Arabs mainly from Jerusalem in the park. Um, and you see them coming, enjoying the park and going home. And on the other hand, you see more and more of a realization, the Jewish side of Jerusalem, that, you know, this is one city. Mm -hmm. It behaves like two cities in some ways, but it, you see more and more of an understanding that there's got to be some kind of... That's true. Um, yeah, that's a great ultra religious Jew. That's a that's a very yeah. pleasant success to have. Yeah. On the other hand, it's challenging because you know you get you get all responses. You get all responses. Mm -hmm. uh, and and teaching people to I think the real story here, and this goes back to where we started. We just had a meeting today because the park has a park reopened to the public in 2015, was closed from 2012, the court ruling that I mentioned before, okay. till 2015, when the, the infrastructure was ready, I lost my line of thought. So we were getting into, I think you were leading into the, the visitor center conversation, I'm thinking. And it's a story, is a story, but it's a story of taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we would like people to take home. Yeah. And then that means, for example, do we allow people, if you're coming for a picnic in the Gazelle Valley, are you allowed? I'm not asking what you personally would do. Mm -hmm. I think I can guess that. Mm -hmm. But are you allowed? Do we allow you to use disposables? for a picnic in the park yeah Likely i don't not. know yeah. yeah well at the moment we are now oh okay and yeah. and we've you know if i mentioned before the ultra religious ultra religious jews in israel gigantic gigantic consumers of disposables i mean if you've got seven kids and you belong to a culture where you host 
So on Friday night, you'll have a family of nine come over for supper, and that's a normal Friday night. Yeah, You're not going to stand washing dishes <laughs> after 18 people on a Friday night at the end of a week's work. You're going to buy disposables. Right. Add to that a religious element of not using a dishwasher on Saturday. There is no <laughs> chance <laughs> that there's a counter on again. Then, wait a minute, you're telling us what to do? Yeah. Are you going to tell me what to do? Oh, it, yeah. I mean, There's, yeah. you see where this is going. It's yeah, yeah. Because we find that when we ask people to not cross the yellow road that separates between the area that's for the public and the natural core, when we use a language of a request, people cooperate. Yeah. But when you write that this is prohibited, Everybody is going to cross the road. Right. If it's prohibited, you're also, people will cross the road. If it's <laughs> please do not, then so it's all about using language. So if you want, so we want to teach people about responsibility. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, what are they taking responsibility for? How are they taking responsibility? We've got a compost, we've got a new compost that could be suitable for basically everybody in the names all around. Mm -hmm. To come and dump the compost stuff in the compost uh, uh, thing, a few of them scattered. They, so far, there aren't so many. What happens educationally to a family that uses that stops throwing everything to the same garbage pail and starts using a compost uh, bin? Mm -hmm. So, so education is a challenging thing. Yeah. So may, maybe we're succeeding so far with the gazelles. We're definitely succeeding with the tortoises. Mm -hmm. I believe we're succeeding with endangered species of, of migrating birds. We need to continue to work in order to succeed with teaching people to take responsibility. That, that's uh, a little longer. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's... it's far more complicated. Right. Far, far more complicated. And it's not enough to just enjoy nature. If if what I want is to get people to take responsibility, I mean, I know people, I saw someone yesterday who definitely enjoys nature. Mm -hmm. And she just took an apple that she'd finished eating and threw it into the woods. Yeah. Now, true, it's organic. And true, somebody will eat it. There's wild boar there. There's birds, there's worms, somebody's going to eat it. But you don't do that with your garbage. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one because that's it's, ingrained it's... in us for so long, you know, with people to just do that. You know, like you said, with the disposables and, so, yeah. and yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to take a lot to, for the human part of that to change, I think. The statement that stands behind the gazelle valley because getting to learn about gazelles to be honest isn't so interesting mm -hmm. i mean who cares if, it, <laughs> if the horn goes like this or like that right right it's bringing the whole yeah the whole system together yeah, yeah it's about it's about making it relevant and one of the ideas that we were discussing is to show who are these people mm -hmm. that struggled in the beginning on the one hand, respect to the people who brought this to help, brought this to help on him. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, to show that the people like you and me, like if you decide that you're going to fight for something you believe in and save something of nature, then, then, then you can do it. Mm -hmm. This wraps up this episode. I am Marcia Civic with Be Provided Conservation Radio. Thank you, Ika Chipman, for sharing the successful urban wildlife story of the Gazelle Valley. And please visit www.gazellevalley.com, and there's a hyphen between gazelle and valley, so you can learn more about this beautiful place. Please also check out their YouTube channel to take a virtual tour of the area. You can also find more photos and similar podcasts at our site at www.beprovided.com. Until next time, stay safe and healthy.